So to continue on with our sales and marketing theme, we have Brent Waba back to give us his presentation from Lean Frontiers Direct, and he will be speaking on the science of value. Brent is on the faculty of Lean Enterprise Institute and is a regular contributor to the Lean Post with articles about value, strategy, and leadership. He is also the author of The Fluff Cycle, which describes an easier, more holistic approach to sales and marketing improvement. So for now, I am going to turn it over to Brent. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? I sure can. That's great. Well, first of all, thanks everybody for, for joining in today. And if you joined in yesterday and didn't hear the whole presentation, we're sorry about that. We had some still mysterious technical problems, but rest assured we've got several layers of technology backup in place now, uh, just in case. I also want to give a special thanks to everybody at Lean Frontiers for not only hosting this series, but uh, also asking me to speak today. So for the next half an hour or so, we're going to talk about that half of Lean that everybody acknowledges as being very, very important. But for some reason, it doesn't really get enough attention during anybody's lean transformation. And that's the topic of, of value. Last year, Qzidian had a research project asking sales reps for the top reasons why they didn't reach their quota. And the top two reasons were that they could not effectively communicate value to the customers and that they were unable to get a customer decision, which no doubt means that uh, customers hadn't gotten to the point where there was enough value in making that decision that they would proceed forward. So we know value is important. We've got a hypothesis as to why we don't put enough emphasis on it, which I will talk about later. But uh, in the meantime, let's get going with the presentation. So this is the science of value. You heard a little bit about me. I started my lean experience about 20, 20 some odd years ago at the Delphi Corporation. We were heading into lean manufacturing and logistics and starting to explore other areas. My first application hands-on in sales and marketing was as a sales engineer. We were developing a new product line and it was my responsibility to go capture the voice of the customer from current and target customers, including engineers, quality people, and buyers. Take that information back and disseminate it to our team, and we'd go through this learning and sharing cycle with our customers. A few years later, I took over responsibility for a struggling global business, and um, I had different responsibilities there. We had the leadership of Jim Luckman and Matt Daco, who you heard from a couple days ago, in the Lean Product and Process Development sphere, but it was my responsibility to figure out how can we leverage lean across the whole enterprise, the entire global business, which meant figuring out what does that group of all of our customers really want. Do we have the right portfolios of products and services to be able to satisfy them? Do we have the manufacturing footprint to be able to deliver that value as efficiently and effectively as possible? All the way down to, hey, it's taking us way too long to quote and that's causing us many problems and it's causing our customers problems. So how can we reduce our quote lead time by 75%? We didn't look at lean as being our strategy, but we looked at lean as being the set of solutions or potential solutions towards implementing our strategy. And the fact that I'm here talking to you today means that we were successful in turning around that business. Got us consulting company, Strategy Science. I'm on the Faculty of Lean Enterprise Institute, and I do a lot of work with startups pro bono through SCORE. And uh, as you heard earlier, I, I write quite a bit. Okay, so let's talk about you. What's keeping you up at night, right? There's no doubt that the vast majority of those who are engaged in lean sales marketing want to sell more, right? And as we break down that, that problem, that how do we sell more question, Right. We get a number of other questions, which could be around customer satisfaction. Are we getting what we need to out of our investment in marketing? Are our products and services good enough? How do we connect with our customers? How do we get repeat business and word of mouth? We can work through efficiency and effectiveness of our processes, and there's no doubt that that will improve all of these. But at the core of all of this 
is the value that we're providing and are we providing enough so that customers want to buy our products. Right, so today's journey, we're going to talk about where lean has gone a little bit wrong in most cases, what value is, get into the human brain and learn a little bit more about how customers make decisions. Once we start heading down this path of looking at other sciences, we realize that there are lots of options that we could pursue in our improvement activities and uh, probably a lot more than we thought. We need to choose the best ones so that we can be efficient and effective in all of our work. And then finally, once we do that, how can we get even better in our processes and culture and the tools that we use? Okay, George Fox was a statistician and he said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Point here is whether it's anything that I say today or anything that you heard over the last couple of days or any tool, we always need to validate our models, our methods, our assumptions. Jim Luckman talked about solution thinking and how we jump from having the, the inklings of a problem to trying to implement a solution to fix it before we've validated that we have a problem, what the problem is what's causing it, the root cause, and finally that our solution is going to work. So again, in everything that I say today, don't take it as you should go do this, but rather here are some ideas, here are some possible paths, make sure that this is the right path so that you should be going on to solve your specific problems. Okay, lean gone wrong. You put 10 lean consultants in a room, you'll get probably 100 different definitions of lean. This is one that we use a lot at LEI, and it's delivering the most customer value while consuming the fewest resources. You'll notice that waste is not part of this definition. It really is about customer value. The way Lean is supposed to work is that we create a customer-focused, value-focused purpose of our organization. We're going to deliver value. Then we work on effectiveness, making sure that our customers get that value, and only then do we work on efficiency. Unfortunately, what happens in the vast majority of organizations is that we jump to focusing on waste and we don't get the business results that we really want and then we're off to something else like, like seven sigma. So it's no secret that the vast majority of lean transformation exercises fail to meet the objectives of the business. And one of the reasons is that we're focused maybe too much on waste instead of what the customer really wants and cares about is more value. If we step away from our lean world, let's start talking business and strategy, are we competitive, how do we make profit? Well, now we're talking value again. So if our objective is profitable growth, we're a for-profit enterprise, right? There are many different models of, of looking at how we deliver value. There's the jobs to be done model, there's the problems pain model, but at the end of the day, it's what do customers really value and are willing to pay for? I value Ferraris and Lamborghinis. I don't have one because I'm really not willing to pay for one right now. And neither is my wife. Once we understand customer value, it's still not enough. We need to offer more value than the alternatives. These are our competitors, or sometimes it's that, that customer not making a decision. I'm just going to live with the pain that I have. We need to have the capabilities in our organization to deliver value. And this is our, our common lean, lean operations side. What are our value streams and do they support what we're telling our customers that, that we have in terms of delivering value? And can we do it at a profit that makes us a good investment? And finally, there's a lot of issues around communicating the value that we have. So we can have all those other three elements in place, be able to offer so much value, but if we can't communicate it properly to our customers in the right time and place and way that they recognize it and acknowledge it and then give them a little nudge and a call to action. Right? We're not going to sell anything. Our customers aren't going to obtain the value that we're trying to provide. So value is really critical in other aspects of our business and we don't talk enough about the strategic part of value in the lean world. So this leads me to my very scientific hypothesis, so why don't we focus more on value? Why don't we understand it better? And that's really that value is squishy. It's hard to define. So we can define it, we don't know what our gaps are, we can't solve our problems, and we can't bridge those gaps and offer more value. So let's get into it. 
what is value? Right. Maybe what something is worth. It could be dollars, it could be trade. I might be willing to trade five sheep for your cow. But there's a worth element to it. There's a usefulness. Right? If it's not that useful, it might not be that valuable. Not everything has to do with goods and services. Right? These could be ideas, these could be religions or political affiliations. It might just be my willingness to spend time or take action with value. And if I want to get very fancy and use math, I can create equations or massive spreadsheets that talk about the benefits minus costs. And there's a number of different elements to do that. But what I'm thinking is that this really isn't everything. There's something that we're missing here that hits us in the face every day. And to get into it, it's, well, why are all these puppies and kittens in advertisements? The answer is it's emotion. Human beings, we all have emotions and we value emotions. If we really want to get people on our side or pull at their heartstrings, we add a very cute baby to it. So what we mostly care about, or what we care about is customer perceived value. And this is an unconscious emotional and social value to what we do. And we're not just talking about life insurance or pampers or dog food. There's many other things, and this happens a lot in, in B2B business too. Poor experience causes 75% of customer defection. If we ask our salespeople why we lost the business, most often they say it was price. When we ask customers, they say, well, it was a bad experience that we had. And if you break that 75% down, over half of that is actually occurring during the actual buying selling process, the transaction. We're all influenced by fear. And we want solutions to take away our fear. So life insurance and tires, um, whatever political party we elect into office, we have fear and we want someone to come. There's value in taking away our fears. Part of that starts with the relationship that we have with the people who are selling us things. So if I don't have a trusting and secure relationship with my vendor or my salesperson, I'm just going to compound my fear. Finally, in the back of our, our minds and our brains, we've got all these processes going on. And we all want to be happy and we want to be entertained and we want to get promoted. Uh, we all want to be attractive. We all want to be cool. All these things get into the mix in our unconscious minds and it's hard to separate what, what do they really mean. I've, I've worked with manufacturing engineers who get very, very excited about the controllers for their screw machines. Right. These are all part of the emotions that are in the mix. We also care about what other people say or think, our friends and our relatives, or even other people on the internet. One of the things that got talked about a lot in the last few days is pricing. And pricing has a lot to do with value. We had Brian Maskell, Ori Fumi, and Ed Miller all talk about cost models and pricing and market pricing and things like this. I'd say unless we're selling wheat or some kind of generic cold rolled steel, there really isn't a market price people are willing to pay based on the value that they receive. So we've got a lot of opportunity to improve our profitability by pricing based on what we know about our value. But until we understand what that value is, we're just kind of shooting in the dark, taking this average market price and not doing the best thing. We know for certain markets like luxury goods that we can actually increase the value of a product based on it being scarce and being luxurious. So higher priced products and services sometimes carry more value in the customer's mind. Getting down to hardware. $300,000 is not by any stretch of the imagination the, the most expensive tractor you can buy, but there's quite a few differences in what you get for your $300,000. So this nice shiny green John Deere tractor with the tank treads appeals to a very specific set of buyers. And those farmers 
want their accessories, even if they don't come from John Deere, to be that green or to be that yellow so that they match. Alternatively, we could buy a very not green, a blue New Holland tractor with eight wheels. Now, that's a different technical solution than the tank treads on the John Deere, but there's an element of emotion in that blue tractor. And then finally, there's this red, Ferrari red case that looks nice and aerodynamic. And with that, we can probably plow our fields at 6.1 miles an hour instead of six. There's a lot of emotion in how our equipment looks. Uh, but what you can't see in the pictures is what else really matters to a farmer. So a lot of farmers have a two-week window to earn their year's worth of income. And their machines need to be on the field, ready to go, serviced, to hit that two-week window. And if not, their local dealer needs to be there fixing that part. You can't exactly drag your tractor down to the dealer and get a loaner tractor. It's got to be ready to go. And that's all part of the value equation. The other thing I want to talk about is that what customers value is plastic, or we can change it. And there have been lots of little experiments along the way that, that show this. Uh, Sullivan nods when your waiter or waitress gives you just a little nod when they're telling you what the specials are. And just that little push drives the 60% selection rate for the liver special. When we first started putting anti-smoking warnings on cigarette packs, it actually increased the desire for cigarettes. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, when my wife and I shop at Trader Joe's, we have a tendency to buy a lot more when we have a cart than when we're using the little baskets. There have been experiments that show that people like their beer more when there's music going on in the background. And if you're trying to prove your value to the judge, you're trying to get parole, um, it's good to know that your judge just ate something because blood sugar as well as temperature and lighting and time of day all have impact on what people do when they make decisions and when they put value on things. So value is very plastic. And if you want uh, some very well-known examples, Steve Jobs is often quoted as saying that Apple knows what customers want before customers know that. I think there's a little more to that story in that Apple customers are very loyal and are, not in a negative way, but influenced by what Apple produces. So Apple just came out with a new iPhone that doesn't have a headphone jack, and Apple is able to save money and improve reliability, but at the same time take away a feature that a lot of people relied on, and at this point people seem to be willing accept, to accept that. Dyson sells a very premium priced vacuum cleaner. It's not necessarily better than, than ones that cost several hundred dollars less, but through their commercials, they are able to influence their buyers to put more value on certain features, like that ball or the way the hose comes out so that you can vacuum up the stairs. Also does not hurt that the gentleman on the commercial who's speaking has a European accent, and that is also very valuable to your typical North American housewife who is their target customer. So we can change what people perceive as their value in many cases. Okay, so what's going on? Why is this? Well, if you want to go to the real Gemba, it's, it's the customer's mind. Customers' brains, human brains are very complex. It's got about 100 billion neurons. They don't always fire, which means given a certain set of uh, conditions, they won't always decide the same thing. Most of our thinking, even though it feels very different, most of our thinking is, is unconscious. We don't really know what's going on. A decision or a feeling bubbles up to our conscious mind. My favorite part of all this is that the human brain uses itself as little as possible. Brain weighs about three pounds and uses 20% of our energy. And human brain evolved to use itself as little as possible because we needed that energy to survive and run away from the lion. One of the things the brain has done to compensate for this is create a number of shortcuts and biases to making decisions and creating emotions so that 
we can jump to a solution, there's that solution thinking again, without having to think about it a lot in our conscious brain and use a lot of glucose. One of those shortcuts is that decisions require emotions. So we have an experience, we have an emotional response, we tag that experience or that memory with an emotion, and when we come to what we perceive as a similar situation, those emotions allow us to act about 3,000 times faster than if we really had to think about it in our conscious brain. So if I go to the local electronic store and I have a very bad experience, I'm going to remember that, even if it's on the unconscious level, and the next time I need to get some electronics, I may not think about it consciously, but I may avoid that same electronics store. We also have certain neurons in our brains that perceive other people's emotions. So getting back to the puppies and the kittens and the circumstances in the insurance commercials, right, we learn through other people and we can feel their emotions. This is all part of the mix. Cutting to the chase, we want to change ourselves or other people. We can only do it on an incremental level because it causes a physical rewiring of the brain. And experiences are much more important than telling people things. So I'm telling you a lot of stuff today. I hope you remember it or I hope you refer back to it. But I think the only way that you're really going to have a very positive emotional reaction to this is if you go try this. Go run experiments. Go use this in your work. And that will tag it, hopefully positively. And you'll want to do it again. It's also the reason why Vitamix, who's trying to sell you a $500 blender, wants you to go home and try that blender. And you can return it within 30 days, but that experience allows you to understand what you can really benefit or gain from it. It also changes your perception of that from being something I'm buying to something I already own. Okay, there's a lot of science behind all of this. Right. This is outside of our typical lean world, and this has been studied in many different, different branches of science. It would be difficult or impossible for us to try to pick and choose which of these little elements we need in our specific situations. Right? There are just too many possible elements and, and parts of science and experiments that people have run to be able to, to build a model that says, okay, our customers are in these circumstances and they're going to think and act a certain way. Right? But we can, through our understanding of complex processes and systems, have a more efficient and effective way of getting to a better answer. So when we talk about a customer's process, it's the buyer's journey. Right? And we've all seen this in, in sales or marketing textbooks, that customer go through these five stages of grief or whatever. Uh, but in reality, it's, it's much more complicated. I think about a car buying process. My wife and I just bought a new car, and our buyer's journeys for cars started when we were kids, when we first started perceiving the kinds of cars our families had. I think Fords are fine products, but we had a Ford Falcon that we got rid of after it caught fire, and I need to consciously overcome that kind of a bias. It has nothing to do with anybody that's designing forts today, but that's what happened to me in my life and it has an influence. So over time, we gain and we lose value and we receive influence, we create influence to other people through feedback. And if this all works the way we want it to, our customers are going to buy stuff, they're going to use it, they're going to be happy, they're going to repeat their purchase, and they're going to tell other people about it. Well, when we get into the nuts and bolts of it and how do we improve it, We've got a lot of complex interacting processes. So the buyer's going through their journey. We in sales and marketing are trying to influence these, these buyers with information and adding value, but at the same time, our competitors are doing the same thing. They're hearing things through the media. They're reading consumer reports. They're having social interactions with their friends. And it's a complicated situation. So let's break down these, these loops. Yesterday, Catherine Radica talked about these learning loops. And there are probably more of these learning loops than we recognize because some of them are very intentional, some of the things that we're doing as, as sellers and marketers. And also some of these things are happening because customers are just living their lives. So if we think about just a simple, simple loop of I'm a seller, you're a customer, I'm giving you information. 
hopefully it's some type of useful knowledge. It's going to cause some type of reaction. Hopefully it's positive. It could be negative and some emotion associated with that. If it's positive enough or emotional enough, right, I'm going to form a memory or maybe a behavior change. I'm going to change your perception about our products or services or make you get closer to wanting to buy what we're offering. And we're hoping at the end of the day that we're adding enough value because if we add enough value through this process over time and the customer recognizes that value, then at the end, when they're making that final decision, yes or no, it, it should, no pun intended, be a no-brainer decision. We want to get to that point. So what are the, the implications of this? Well, a lot of the common sales methodologies like Spin and Sandler, Consultative, they're a bit incomplete. Right? We're, we're very focused on getting to the transaction. The process is actually much longer before and after the transaction, and we've got interactions with the rest of our organization so we can take this information that we're getting and this influence that we're receiving from our customers and hopefully push or more appropriately hopefully get pulled into the rest of the organization. All right. So if we want to make an improvement, this I think is one of the big ahas here, is that we've got to simultaneously improve both our internal processes but the process for our customer. Again, the customer journey is a process. Our internal processes are value streams or processes but they both interact. So if we want to make an improvement to the overall system, we need to Im improve both of these. We need to figure out what's the right time and place to add value and positive influence. Our competitors are saying bad things about us or that their stuff is better, right? We need to counteract negative influence. We're all overburdened. Everybody receives between 5,000 and 10,000 media messages a day and roughly three have a very positive impact. So if we overload our customers, if we overproduce with too much information and we try to influence too much, we overburden them. And an overburdened customer is more likely to not make a decision. And then finally, incremental decisions, and this actually is borne out in a lot of these sales methodologies, right? When we walk into a car dealership, we don't want to hear coming out of the salesperson's mouth the first thing, do you want to sign on the dotted line? Right? We're making incremental decisions. Is this the right brand? Is this the right model? What features do I want? What are my other considerations? So taking a customer through an incremental decision-making process, and this is what a lot of good salespeople do, is very important. Otherwise, we do overburden them and we don't get to the decision that we want. So what do we do now? Well, we need to think about Sales and marketing is really it's an end-to-end -end learning and improvement process, and we can get better in our process if we ask the right questions throughout this process. So who are the customers we're targeting? Who influences them? What, in terms of value, are we offering? It could be the product, the service, the information, the things we do to make their life easier along the way. Why would you pick us, which is a value proposition, over the alternatives? How do we communicate in terms of the message or the experience? When do we do it? Where do we do it? And again, as we're trying to step through this buying process, right? what are we hoping to get? If we know what kind of behavior we want to get from our customers at each step of their buying process, right? that'll help us to influence them better. So we could talk for days about this whole list here. I just want to cover a little more deeply is the what and the why us. So determining what a customer perceives is actually quite tricky, right? We can ask ourselves. I'm sure many of you have been in meetings where somebody said, well, if I was the customer, I would want. Okay, well, that's your conscious brain trying to understand what somebody else's unconscious brain is looking for. Same thing happens when we're value stream mapping processes, and I've seen this happen a lot in sales and marketing. We're mapping our process, and we spend most of the time, the vast majority of time, thinking about what we're doing and not understanding what our customers are doing. Personas, uh, if you're not familiar with it, we're trying to put ourselves in a target customer's shoes to be able to understand what they perceive. And this can be done very, very well. Um, Menlo does this very, very well, but it's also very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing because you get an answer and you don't really know if you haven't validated it that it's the right answer. So we can ask ourselves, it's kind of dangerous. 
we can ask customers directly through surveys and focus groups. And um, if you've never heard the phrase before, customers lie. Not necessarily intentionally, but customers have a hard time about elaborating on what they want to be able to make a decision. We get all these samples in the grocery store, and we get a coupon, and the person asks, did you like this? Oh, yes. Are you going to buy it? Oh, yes. And the vast majority of people who say yes are going to buy it don't. So asking directly is hard. It's hard to create a good survey. It's hard to get the right sample of return surveys to look at what the, the overall population is really going to do. We know from the, the recent election in the United States here that surveys can be wrong. So another approach is to ask indirectly to try to reach the unconsciousness. And there are a number of ways we can do this, more tools and techniques than I could possibly cover today. But the first is just observation. Right? We watch how the farmer is interacting with his or her tractor or how a customer is acting within the grocery store. We can learn a lot just by watching what people do unconsciously. We can run experiments, simple experiments. You would think by now with all the millions of web pages that we'd know what make a, makes a good web page. We don't. But we can break up the population into two groups and run an A-B comparison where half goes to one, half goes to another, and we'll look at the conversion rate, see which uh, web page or landing page has a better conversion rate. If we want to get very fancy, we can shove people into MRI machines and really look at their brain and different parts of their brain while we're showing them commercials or or logos or things like that and understand well, what's going on at that unconscious level. Lots of statistical techniques, analytics, choice modeling, conjoint, lots of many different techniques. Or we can ask indirect questions, which is like the net promoter score. You know, on a scale of 0 to 10, would you recommend this product or service to your friends or family? Right? That takes it out of, of um, the conscious brain into an emotional, well, if I'm going to put my reputation on the line, I better be sure about it. Um, and then a count of miles. So just a, a couple examples here. First uh, is the count of model. Again, not saying go use this model, but I'm using this for demonstration purposes. And the count of model basically says that different attributes of the product or the service have different characteristics. So if I look at satisfaction versus performance or quality, right, I have some some attributes that the customer just doesn't care about. Well, from a lean perspective, this is good to know. If the customer doesn't care about that, then we shouldn't focus a lot on that. I worked with a company that was making small electronic components, and they believed that customers really wanted very small electrical connectors. Well, it didn't turn out so good because they were more expensive to produce and they had quality issues in manufacturing and they had field quality issues. So it, it cost them tens of millions of dollars. The engineers believed that this was something that customers really wanted. When they asked their customers, they said, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it was a bit of a disaster for them. Right. There are threshold or must-haves. So if you buy that New Holland tractor, you must have eight wheels on it, not seven. There's some things that are just more, the more the better, one dimensional. And finally, things that are are not expected, but really get you excited. So I once, once leased a car that had a heated steering wheel, and I was living in the uh, cold tundra of western New York, and I thought, well, at the time that I got the car in the summer, well, what the heck am I going to do with this? It was just another thing that's going to break. Well, when I got to be below zero, that was a really cool feature to have, and I was very excited about it. Another example, statistical attribute models. This is conjoint. Again, not promoting conjoint over other models, but basically packaged coffee has roughly 100 different attributes. And if you do the statistical analysis, only six really affect the utility or the purchase decision. And if we know what these six are and we know what the cost model is behind these, we can make better business decisions. We can offer products that the customers will, will want and we'll know that ahead of time. And um, we can look at trade-offs, cost-benefit trade-offs, and predict market share. So the, the important takeaway from this is not the model, but the when your customer is making a buying decision, 
you may have a laundry list of attributes that you're trying to hit, but in reality, it's probably only four, five, six, or seven different attributes that really make a statistical difference in whether a customer is going to buy your product or service. There are lots of things we can do that aren't performance or price-driven attributes. It's got the value stream and the experience. The music on iTunes is not any different than any of the other streaming services, but it is different in terms of how we receive it or the process than buying a CD or vinyl. There are systems level things we can do through standardization. We can make big systems cheaper. We can take little parts of the system. We can take on more. These all can add value if these are one of your four, five, or six attributes that are important. Um, we can add value added services. If we're selling IT services, right? System design is a value added service, and a lot of that occurs during our sales and marketing process. We also provide valuable knowledge so that customers can make better decisions and they do value that. We can and often need to think about our customers' customers. So if, if I'm designing buildings and my customer promotes themselves as being a green business, well, then the building that I'm designing should be LEED certified so that they can talk about that to their customers. And then finally, and this is much harder to do, but there's a lot of value that has to do with brand and status and social attraction. So if I'm opening up a coffee shop and I want to have more social attraction, I might add comfy chairs so that people stay and they interact. Okay, so speaking of coffee shops, um, you may be aware that Starbucks had a lean journey. It's around 2008 when they were opening way too many Starbucks. You could literally step out of a Starbucks in one part of the world and walk across the street and go into another Starbucks. So they were trying to change how they uh, were approaching their business and they adopted Lean to do that. And for them, their mission essentially was to, to be able to offer consistent, high quality, handcrafted beverages, right? And that sounds good. Um, mission-y kind of thing, but when it comes to lean, that's not really something that people can grab a hold of and do something specific about. I don't know how you be 30% more handcrafted, but they needed to translate that into something. So for them, or for their customers, I should say, it got down to taste, speed, friendliness, and accuracy. Those are the four things that they really wanted to improve, and that drove their lean activities so that they had a consistent method of the work and a consistent method of teaching the work. And that drove a lot of their, their lean behavior. So that taste, speed, friendliness, and accuracy, that was their value proposition. So what is the value proposition? This is something that, that answers that question, why would you pick us over any of your other alternatives, right? So it's a value we offer from the customer's perspective. And on a, a mental level, it's a shortcut. If you go to me and say, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee, right? I want that shortcut to be, great, there's a Starbucks across the street, let's go there. As opposed to, well, should we go to Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or, right? We don't want people having to make these decisions. We want this, this mental shortcut because there's a, a good viable value proposition. But if we think about it from our company's perspective, it can also be an ongoing learning and improvement process. So if we know what we want to focus on through our value proposition, we can create alignment from product and service development, from our strategy side, from our operations and delivery side. So everybody's focused on the right same things. And when we do that, we reduce our overall effort across the entire enterprise. It helps us with our competitive analysis, our positioning. When we start to design our product or service or the customer experience, right, we know what we want to focus on, and it makes selling and promoting much easier because we're not overburdening, overwhelming our customers with, again, a laundry list of attributes. We know what customers really want and value, and hey, we're here to offer that too, and we can prove it. Value propositions come in many shapes and sizes. You've all heard the tagline, no or light, taste great, less selling. Kind of tells you what it is. FedEx, when it absolutely positively has to be there overnight. Pork was the other white meat, and a lesser known cousin to that was bacon, which is the gateway meat for vegetarians. 
Okay. When I was at Delphi, we worked in value propositions a lot. This helped a lot of our lean activities because this was a, a way we could not only communicate internally what we needed to accomplish, but we were able to work better, more closely with our customers in creating these value propositions. So we would look at all the attributes and we'd go to our customers and say, are these the right attributes? They'd say, yes, no, you're missing one. We would show them our competitive analysis and what we were targeting in our products, and we could get some good feedback from them. Sometimes they said, no, you're not as good as you think, but a lot of times they also said, you know what, you're actually better than, than you're letting on. So we were able to help our customers and help ourselves at the same time, communicate better, engage them in the development process, which is also part of the buying process. The key thing here, that, though, is which were really the critical attributes that were going to, at the end of the day, mean a buying decision, and are we talking to the right people throughout that process? An application example is the Square credit card reader. So back in 2015, about when they were first coming out, um, their value proposition was started very simply. Everybody should be able to accept credit cards. And that was a first step in the selling process. And if you were one of their potential customers, you could read that and go, yes. It used to be I'd need this expensive machine and I had to plug into a wall on the phone line and that's not really convenient down at the farmer's market. Right, this is great. And then they built on that. So this incremental building of value, saying, well, it's not just about running credit cards. We can do your back office stuff on your phone or your, your laptop. And we're also thinking about your customers, right? So if, if um, your Nana is selling salsa down at the farmer's market, right? Your Nana can, can uh, take credit cards too. So very effective use of it, very simple. Down at the bottom there is a great call to action, right? We build all this value. We're working on heading down that path of incremental decisions. And a lot of times that no decision is that we didn't ask our customer to make a buying decision. We didn't prompt them to do something next. And this happens on web pages all the time, but it also happens in large contracts. So here they're saying, well, we can start accepting credit cards today. Great. It's not that complicated. Sign up and we'll mail you a free square reader. Right? Very simple process. Gets them to the point where they've got the thing. Once they have it, they're going to start to use it. And... Um, that ownership helps make their final decision much easier. So what do we do next in all this? This is a lot of stuff, I apologize. It might be a little overwhelming at first. But first of all, Lean 101. And this is forgotten so many times, I can't tell you all the companies that I've visited that just have not aligned their, their purpose and their strategy with real customer value. And that's because they don't understand really what customers value. It's very fuzzy and, and nebulous. We need to improve both our internal and our customer processes at the same time. Right? We can do one and we'll get some improvement. We can do the other and we'll get some improvement. But if you really want to get that synergistic effect, we need to improve both at the same time. There are so many more attributes we could be leveraging and some of the breakthroughs in business these days are not technical hardware related things. There are some other element of the associated service like iTunes. And so we've got a lot of things that we can leverage. We need to look at that entire buyer's journey, typically much, much further behind and ahead of where we're in the picture. We need to start before we we initiate our designing of the product or the service or the customer experience. And don't forget customer experience which is very critical, and we talked about earlier for repeat purchase, don't forget we need to, to think about designing that too. But at the end of the day, we need to figure out what those really critical attributes are that are really going to motivate our customers to, to purchase from us. And through this presentation, we're talking about a much broader scope of things we could do. That's not easy to start to think about. We have processes to get you there. But the good news is that there are probably fewer things we have to work on at 
at the end of this process than we typically do. So the net is that we approve our efficiency and effectiveness over time if we understand what those things are. If we know what those things are, it helps us competitively too because we can now focus our capability improvement, which is another major element of lean, so that we support our value proposition. Continuous improvement of these models and these methods and the way we influence is very important and we need to use a scientific method. Back to solutions thinking, sales and marketing world is, is the worst. I've, I've worked in lean in every aspect of the business and the number of solutions that are available to the sales and marketing world is, is tremendous. We can use science, though, to determine what it is we really need to, to be using and how do we improve them. When we're talking about using science, right, just remember that there's more to the science of, of customers than just lean. We can use a lean framework, that's what we did at Delphi, we can use a lean framework to drive our improvement activities, to align our improvement activities to our business problems and our customer problems but when it gets down to these little learning cycles and what are we going to do and how are we going to do it, there is other science out there that we need to pull in to, to make these, these better decisions on how we're going to improve our processes. If you don't do these things, you might end up on my, my board of epic value fails, which are some important lessons learned in, in the models that we've been talking about. The first is the Pontiac Aztec. I say Pontiac is no longer with us. But um, the Aztec is one of the first crossover vehicles and it had a lot of neat features and functions and technology, but it was pretty darn ugly. And GM, through their customer clinics, had heard loud and clear, your car is ugly. And they said, well, we recognize that, but we believe there's value in being different. And there's a difference between being different and being different and better. And Pontiac did not sell too many of these, and eventually Pontiac ceased to exist. The next is uh, the Segway. Lots of fun. Before the Segway came out, they were overhyped. The cities were going to redesign themselves around this new mode of transportation. And it didn't take too long before, after they came out, that um, cities banned them. Yes. Uh, we just have a couple minutes left, so I just wanted to give you okay. a heads up on Last slide. Okay. Thank you. All right. Harley-Davidson Cologne was not particularly popular. And finally, New Coke. Coke was trying to challenge Pepsi and the Pepsi challenge and come up with a sweeter drink, and they knew through blind taste testing that people preferred that, but what they failed to recognize is that there's an emotional attachment to Coke if that's what you grew up with, and people didn't want that change, even if it was a technically superior product. So that is the end of my presentation. I thank you very much for your time, and it, I don't know if there are any questions, but if there are, I'm open right now for them. All right. Well, it looks like we haven't had any questions come in so far. Um, okay. Uh, it looks like we've got your contact information there on the slide, so if something does come on, um, if everybody just wants to jot that down quickly and then they can reach out to Brent directly. Does that sound good to you, Brent? That would be great. Perfect. All right. Um, well, Brent, thank you so much for facilitating our session today. Uh, just a reminder to all of you guys tuning in, uh, the webinar today will be recorded, so look for an email following our time together for a link to the recording, and feel free to share this throughout your organization. So thanks again to Wayne, who spoke earlier today, and to Brent, and thank each one of you for participating in today's session. So goodbye, and have a great weekend.